Hello everyone, this is a A-level economics revision or exam booster session looking specifically at behavioral economic policies that you would study in year 13 or in the second year of your A-level course. I have split this revision video up into two. So we have part one, which is looking at choice architecture, nudge theory and framing. And then part two, we'll look at three other forms of uh, behavioral economics and also include a section solely looking at the overall evaluation of behavioral economic policies. The way that I have designed this booster session is that it will look at the format of what we call the perfect paragraph, i.e. it will take each behavioral economic policy, it will look at what it is, how it works, why governments would use it, some examples where examples are relevant, and also look at evaluating that one individual policy. You will find that for behavioral economics, a large amount of the evaluation for one policy can also be rolled over into another policy. But there are some differences in those uh, nudge theories. So like I said, this is part one, looking at what is and evaluating choice architecture, nudge theory and framing. So to get started, if we look at first of all, the overall definition or underarching definition of what is behavioral economics. Behavioral economics is a method of economic analysis that applies psychological insights into human behavior to explain how individuals make choices and decisions. So behavioral economics is different from traditional uh, rational uh, economic man uh, theory. Behavioral e economics looks at the idea that individuals or certainly individual decision making is influenced by a number of cognitive biases. Now, it would be the expectation that you would have revised and gone over the different types of cognitive biases before watching this uh, revision video. This does not contain information on uh, cognitive biases. But behavioral economics looks at the idea that um, no individual can ever be described as being perfectly rational. There are a number of factors which influence the ability of an individual to make a rational decision. So it applies psychological insight into human behavior. Why do we make the decisions that we do? And what influences us to make those decisions? Now, you may be thinking, why is the government interested in us making decisions? Why does the government take an active role in influencing the decisions that we make in society? And it is for that reason. The government is responsible for the welfare of society. They are aware that some individuals in society may not always make what is perceived to be the most rational decision. It is leading to elements of market failure. We have situations where we have the over and under consumption of goods because individuals through their psychological insights are not making the right decision. So for example, people are unaware of the true dangers of smoking cigarettes. They are unaware of the true benefits of going to the gym and engaging in exercise. Behavioral economics looks at the psychological reasons as to why individuals make those decisions in the first place. And we also look at what type of policies could be used to in effect nudge or influence, or in some cases, manipulate a consumer or manipulate a member of society to make decisions in a way that will achieve government objectives. So behavioral economics and economic policy. Behavioral economics is challenging the traditional view of rational economic man. It is becoming significantly more popular in society, and it's something that governments are using more frequently now than what they've ever done before. They realize that things like taxes and subsidies and minimum and maximum prices all the traditional methods or what we often refer to as the shove policies. They are effective, yes, but they are effective only to a certain degree. We often think, of, and when I will often say this, is that there is a reason why people behave in the way that they do. What I like personally about behavioral economics is that it seeks to understand that behavior and it implements policies then to change that behavior once we understand why and how people make the decisions that they do. Behavioral economics contributes to government policies, notably in the area of government intervention to overcome market failure. We will go over uh, in a few minutes 
a number of examples of where governments are using behavioural economics to overcome issues um, around market failure. So things like how can behavioural economics be used, certainly during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, things like stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. That's an example of a nudge, um, an example of mandated choice. Um, for example, when we look at the wearing of face masks in uh, public places, we also look at examples of where nudge theory is being used to encourage children in schools to have a healthy diet, um, to encourage people, uh, even adults, to adopt a healthy diet. Um, behavioural economics around smoking, around alcohol, even around merit goods as well. What can we do to nudge people to consume goods or act in a way that is deemed to be socially acceptable? The government is using nudges to gain the desired outcome. The key words there are desired outcome. The government will look at what is the problem that we face, what is the desired outcome, and therefore what can be done to change behaviour to get people to follow that path towards the desired outcome. Overall, nudges are criticised because they are seen to interfere with individuals' freedom of choice. Now, I'm saying this to you now before we go through the different policies, because I want you to be, uh, I want you to think about these policies are great, yes, but almost on an ethical point of view, are the governments being too paternalistic? Are they taking on too much the role of the nanny state, or are they taking on too much the role of, in effect, the parent? The government is deemed to be the parent, and we are deemed to be the naughty children who are unable to make rational decisions. But one of the things I want you to keep thinking about in the back of your minds with behavioural economics is that unlike traditional policies, choice still remains. The individual still remains the freedom of choice. So, for example, if I go out and I purchase um, uh, fatty foods or a sugary drink, for example, I will have to pay the sugar tax, whether I like it or not. By law, I must pay that uh, sugar tax. There's no way of me getting out of it. With behavioural economics, the choice still remains. I could go in and I could be provided with a, a, a nudge of some sort to try and encourage me not to purchase that sugary drink or indeed to purchase it at a, a lesser quantity than what I maybe would have done so before. The choice still remains. However, my decision making and the process in which that decision making has happened has been interfered with. It's been manipulated through the provision of behavioural economics. Government policy is to use them to over uh, if the outcome is desirable. So governments will engage in behavioural economic policies if they believe that if it is successful, they will achieve the desired outcome. If you think about cognitive biases and herding behaviour, what we want to do is to use behavioural economics to herd people in a direction towards the most desirable outcome. In imperfect markets, and bear in mind, we would say that all markets are imperfect other than perfect competition, although I would argue there is still a degree, a very small degree um, of imperfectness in those markets. In imperfect markets, rational decisions are not possible anyway, since producers are restricting information available to consumers. So if you look at the different types of market structures, so if we look at monopolistically competitive markets, oligopoly, duopoly, and a monopoly market structure, in all of those uh, imperfect markets, there is a presence of imperfect knowledge where maybe the, uh, the, the uh, seller possesses more information about the good than the buyer. And we often see, for example, maybe that the seller is withholding information from the buyer. They're withholding information that is preventing the buyer from making the most rational decision. If you think about what we looked at in lessons, we looked at, for example, the secondhand car uh, market, where maybe the seller of that car knows that there's something wrong with it, knows there's something that is not particularly right about it. But if they were to say that to the consumer, that may then lower the price of that product. The seller's objective is to maximize their profits. So in imperfect ma markets, rational decisions are not possible anyway. And so therefore, behavioral economics is designed to try and encourage consumers to make what is perceived to be the most rational decision. If we look at behavioral nudge theory, now, this is where you get slight uh, elements of confusion here, because there are different types of nudges, um, of which a nudge is one of them. So for example, choice architecture is a nudge, whereas there are other nudge policies. 
So it's almost like an umbrella term. Uh, and within that, there are a range of other slightly different elements of nudge theory. If traditional economic theory does not hold in every aspect of life, there is a role for behavioral policies to be used to complement government social and economic policies. Now, this word to complement government social and economic policies, I want to focus on that just for a few seconds, because what I want us to look at here is, and certainly if we think ahead of our final evaluation, the best forms of evaluation are saying it is not clear cut. It's not a case of you use behavioral and totally ignore traditional or you use traditional and totally uh, ignore behavioral. We say that traditional policy is probably long standing. Um, it's something that's been around for years and it's something that has been tried and tested. And certainly the outcome of that testing proves that traditional economic theories and policies do actually work. Behavioral economics is something that's slightly newer. It therefore is less tested than traditional policies. However, there is evidence that when behavioral policies are used alongside traditional policies, it can complement government social and economic policies. If the government wants to achieve those social policies and objectives, behavioral economics is a good method for that. Choice architecture or nudge policies can be used where an individual's choice is influenced by how information is presented. Now, certainly with choice architecture and with nudge theory, we are looking at what is the desired outcome. Once we realize what that desired outcome is, we then need to think very carefully about how then do we present that information to consumers in a way that will get them to achieve the desired outcome. So you have to think very strategically about how people behave, about the cognitive biases that they suffer from, and how can information be presented to get or, in effect, achieve the best for that consumer. So first of all, we look at the first one, choice architecture. This theory suggests that consumers' spending patterns are heavily influenced by the way that goods are presented. So the choice architecture, we are thinking about how the choice process is actually made. And we think about if we think that a consumer, there's risk that a consumer could make an irrational decision, let's think then about the process in which the consumer engages in, in order to make that decision. So for example, changing the way goods are sold, presented to a consumer can strongly influence what is bought. One of the most common examples we use of choice architecture is the design of school canteens um, and uh, dining rooms. We think about as students enter into the canteen, what food is first presented to them? Are we giving them fatty foods first in which they're more likely to choose that because we know children tend to like more fattier foods, but they will also, because of cognitive biases, choose the first piece of information that's given to them or they will select the first thing that's given to them. So through choice architecture, we think about this. We think that we know that children like unhealthy food. Therefore, if unhealthy food is the first thing that they see, they're more likely to choose it. If a salad bar is the first thing that they see, maybe they would be more likely to take up eating healthy food first. Choice architecture is a method to retain consumer sovereignty. And please take a note of this word, consumer sovereignty. Sovereignty means it is the right to choose. We haven't completely removed the freedom of making that decision. The freedom of making the decision remains, which is one of the reasons why we like choice architecture. But nudging consumers to make the certain choices exists. So you still can choose unhealthy food, but we are going to think very carefully about how that decision is made, and we are going to try and influence you to make the right decision. The desired outcome is that you choose the healthier option. The risk, or and certainly this is an evaluative phrase as well, there is a risk that that individual could still, at the end of the day, still choose the unhealthy option. We must be realistic with behavioral economics. We must realize that not every consumer will choose the desired outcome. It's a bit like uh, when we looked at poverty and inequality, it is almost, you could argue, irrational to say that we will ever achieve perfect equality. However, it is realistic 
or certainly is more realistic to say that we will narrow the gap of inequality. We will narrow the gap between the rich and the poor. And you can apply that theory and strategy with choice architecture. What we are trying to do is we are trying to get more people to achieve the desired outcome, but also realistic and knowledgeable about the fact that some individuals may not choose the desired outcome. Choice architecture refers to the physical and symbolic environment that faces decision makers at the point where they make a decision. And the perfect example there would be the school canteen. How does the physical environment, how is the layout of the school canteen designed? What does the physical and symbolic environment look like that is influential towards making that decision? If you think about it, the physical environment, um, when architects build new buildings, um, they will often strategically locate the staircase by the lift in which it is designed you can take the lift or you can take the healthier option, which is to take the stairs, which keeps you more active. Um, of course, you may argue that obviously you know, locate the lift by the stairs because you're both going in the one direction. You're going up or down. Um, but certainly there is an element of choice architecture there as well. The decision making environment can have a significant impact on choices that are uh, made. And often if you link this with cognitive biases, herding behavior, social norms, for example, the actual environment in which choices are made um, can lead to uh, greater or lesser degrees of rationality over decision making. Choice architecture can be designed to contain a default option that is applied if the individual takes no decision. Defaults can be set up to improve welfare, such as having low fat milk as the default option when buying a, uh, a coffee. Uh, I experienced this re uh, recently when I was in London Bridge uh, train station. Um, I popped in for a cup of tea, got a cup of tea, but of course you pour your own milk into it. Um, it was low fat milk that was the defaulted option that was given to every um, uh, consumer. If you think about it back in the day, whenever you had milk in primary school, um, there was, a, a, of course, years ago, um, more children drank milk than probably what they do now. Um, but milk is, it's good for you. It's good for the bones. It gives you calcium. Um, and there was issues over uh, children having the right levels of calcium at uh, such a young age. So by giving children milk, the default option was everyone is given milk, but the default is it's semi-skimmed milk. Um, so I remember whenever I was uh, at home, I always drank whole milk because that was the milk my uh, parents always bought. And that was the default in our family home. However, in school, everybody drank semi-skimmed milk, whether you liked it or not. Um, it was the defaulted option. Behavioral econ uh, economists are interested in how choice architecture can be manipulated by public policy makers to improve economic welfare. So um, policymakers will look at the idea of choice architecture and they will look at how can choice architecture be used to manipulate consumers. Now, you may often think that manipulation is a bad thing. Um, and in some cases, yes, it is. And some people who are against behavioral economics would argue that um, uh, it is too manipulative. It's too, it plays too much with the consumer's mind. Um, it removes, it interferes, even though the choice still remains, it is interfering with that choice. So how choice architecture works. When consumers purchase goods, they are often influenced by factors such as defaulted choice. Consumers buy the easiest option. Often this is the option that they have, that they are, uh, have been used to buying before. The default choice involves minimizing costs of choosing and deciding what to buy. So when we look at using choice architecture, let's think of what is the problem? And is there a default choice there? Um, so for example, if we don't want, um, if you look at, for example, school menus, so even the design of the menu, if the issue is that uh, children, so for example, whenever I was at school, in secondary school, you could have got chips every day on the menu. Now, you wouldn't have that today. That's far too unhealthy. But uh, when you lined up in the school canteen to get your food, once you got your tray, once you were handed your plate, the first option that was given to you was chips. Uh, and that's probably because that was the most popular option. Um, almost everybody had chips every day for school. 
um, for most of the dinners because the choice was given to you. Now, if I think back to whenever I was at home, um, my mum would not have made that uh, every day. You got them, you know, it was few and far between that you would have fatty foods like that because she was very health conscious over our uh, diets. But when you look at, think about what is the default of choice and how can you use choice architecture to possibly create a new default of choice? So again, going back to the example of the school canteen, do we turn around the school canteen where we make the healthier options more presented in a way that looks like that's the default of choice? Short-term benefit. Now, this is something we've discussed in lessons before about how consumers often will sacrifice their long-term utility for the sake of their short-term utility. And this is a really good analysis and evaluation point here. Too often, consumers are focused on simply short-term benefits. They ignore the, the long-term impact of their actions. Consumers are more likely to be what we call myoptic, and that means that they are short-sighted. They are too, they live for the moment. Um, they don't always, and the most extreme definitions, you would argue that the individual does not possess a large degree of intelligence to be able to think long-term. So uh, you know, everybody has a degree of an intelligence. Some people are more intelligent to think about the long-term consequences rather than just focus on the short term. So consumers are more likely to be myoptic um, or short-sighted uh, and choose based upon short-term influences. And this is why we need the choice architecture. So for example, on healthy foods, if a child was to eat, you know, if I was to have a, a, a pizza right now, well, it wouldn't kill me straight away. But if I was to have a pizza every day, for the next 10 years, I'd be lucky if I made it for the next uh, 10 years. I certainly wouldn't have the figure I have now. Choice architecture can make use of these factors to encourage consumption of certain goods. And again, I really have strengthened the words here, encourage consumption, because ultimately, as I said before, choice still remains there. You haven't completely removed the choice. That is too dracarian. Choice architecture is a softer approach. You're, you're, you're almost saying, look, it's still there. You still can choose it, but I'm trying to push you in the right direction. Presenting the desired choices as the defaulted option. So we use choice architecture. What is the, the desired uh, option? Let's put healthy foods first. So if you think about it, when, and I noticed this um, uh, yesterday when I was doing my shopping, as soon as you go into the store, as soon as the doors open, the first thing you're met with is the fruit and vegetable aisle. Now, that's for two reasons. One, it, we want it to be the default option. We want you to see all these lovely fresh fruit and vegetables to encourage you to have a healthy diet. Um, but also, we want you um, to purchase them quickly because we remember, remember that um, fresh fruit and vegetable will go out of date. It's more perishable items. Um, they will wither uh, much sooner than maybe tinned products. So we want to sell them quickly. Um, and it's also located near the door where there's plenty of fresh air coming in and it's colder in that part of the store. It's reducing other choices. So if we look at choice architecture, let's look at the school menu. And right, let's factor in that now and again, yes, let's give them um, foods that do contain slightly more fat than others, but let's reduce that. Let's only give it to them on a certain number of days. Special offers and encouragement for choosing a particular option, advertising and campaigns to influence behavior, and changing how the good is packaged. So we know consumers still possess the right to choose, but let's manipulate, let's think very carefully about how that choice is made. Examples here of choice architecture, and I think this is a really, I'm not gonna really flood you with examples, there are many out there, and I would encourage you in your own time to go and look at a few of them, but I've given you what I believe to be the best, certainly what AQA look out for. The opt-in, opt-out scheme. If people have to opt in, many stick with the defaulted option of not opting in. So for example, if we look at um, pensions, and I've talked to you about this before, when you start working, you probably are grateful that you've got a job and your career is just starting. So I started teaching at the age of 23. The last thing on my mind was a pension because I've, only, you know, I've just started my career. Why on earth would I start thinking about the long-term impact of retiring before I've even stepped foot in the classroom yet. If it was left to me to opt in, would I have signed up to a pension scheme? Probably not. Why? Because like I said, it's a long time away. And also whatever money you get in your early days, 
um, you want to try and keep on to that as much as possible. You might want to look for a mortgage. You might want to be buying a new car. Um, you'll want to probably spend more um, and save less. So if it's left to opt in, people ignore it. That's too much work. That's, too, that's extra paperwork. It's too much hassle. We put it off for another day and it ends up that we never come back to it. And then whenever we do need it, we are less prepared for it. So if I signed up for a pension scheme whenever I was in my 40s, um, well, that's about, you know, that's about 20 years uh, of my working career that I could have been spending on a pension that is now unaccounted for. I'm 20 years behind in paying towards a pension. If you have to opt out, many more will take the scheme. So if you automatically enroll them and only give them the choice to opt out, more people are likely to stick with what they've got and not opt out. So you will win more people by not opting out. For example, if donor cards are opt-in, so blood donor or organ donor cards, if they are opt-in, take-up rates may be low. But if the donor cards become opt-out, then take-up rates have been shown to increase. So the government realized, well, there's not enough people who are able to donate their organs or not enough people donating blood. Let's automatically opt everybody in. And the only choice we are giving them is to opt out. So everybody is in, everybody is an organ donor, but if, for example, on religious grounds, you wish to opt out, that is where you have the freedom of decision-making. A similar example is with uh, company pensions, making them opt out significantly increases the take-up uh, rates, and I've already um, discussed that with you. Examples of choice architecture and demerit goods. Now, you'll remember that a demerit good is a good that possesses negative externalities in consumption. Demerit goods, they are considered damaging to the consumer and therefore governments seek to reduce demand of these goods. So how can we use choice architecture to do this? Here are some examples. In the UK, uh, packing of, a packing of uh, cigarettes uh, has been changed to display consequences of throat cancer on the package. Recently, cigarettes are hidden from view, meaning consumers have to make an extra effort to buy the good. And that note of an extra effort to buy the uh, good. What we see here is governments have thought very carefully about the process in which cigarettes are bought. You have to walk in. You can pick them off the shelf as you would do a carton of milk or a loaf of bread or any other products that you get that are openly on the shelf. You have to ask a member of staff. They then go and get the product and hand it over to you. So if we think about it, if people, if we tell people that smoking causes cancers, it goes in one ear out the other for some people. If we show them through visual representation on the front of that cigarette packet, then it may be more inclined or they may be more inclined to think, well, in actual fact, I knew that throat can I knew that smoking caused throat cancer, but this is what throat cancer actually looks like. It could be that image alone that could put them off. So we have to think more creatively about how can we stop individuals from making the decisions they shouldn't be making. We also look at the idea of because now cigarettes are hid, uh, hidden behind a, a screen, that's designed that when young children are in a shop, now you might remember this, but years ago, I remember going into shops and there used to be uh, the cigarette um, display, it used to always be behind the counter, but it used to have this you know, blue light uh, around it. It did look as if this was almost the, the holy grail of the shop itself. And it was very neatly packaged. And there were very di various different designs of lighters, etc. It almost made smoking out to be uh, rather a, a luxury uh, product. Um, they were designed quite well. And of course, young children were intrigued by this. What's all this lights? What's this fancy uh, stall that's so exclusive that it's behind the counter? You're not allowed to touch it. Um, that was encouraging young people to uh, want to become associated with smoking. Also highlighting health costs. In the UK, many firms now highlight low, uh, or sorry, how uh, much sugar or fat is in a product with a percentage of daily recommended amounts. So, you know, if you look at packaging years ago, all it literally contained was the name of the good and often was in a bag of some sort. Uh, and that was given to the consumer. There was less information. People were less knowledgeable about um, uh, what was actually contained in our food. Whereas now we are much more knowledgeable. 
um, we're much more knowledgeable about the impact of sugar content and fat uh, content. We're also given advice through that daily percentage of recommended intake. If consumers see a packet of donuts containing 40% of the daily recommended intake of sugar, this may discourage them from a consumer. They may look at that thing, well, that looks nice, but gosh, 40% of the daily intake, that's quite significant. Choice architecture then for merit goods. Merit goods are considered beneficial and consumers often underestimate these benefits. So we know that merit goods are goods that possess positive externalities in consumption, but they are often under-consumed. For example, the vaccination is very beneficial if everyone takes it, but people may not want to bother. And of course, there are many other reasons as to why people may be uh, reluctant to take it. The government can introduce mass vaccinations in schools and only if parents object can someone avoid it. So again, that element of choice still remains. But the governments are thinking, well, if we bring vaccinations to school, that may be more likely to take the burden of parents and therefore may increase the uptake in those vaccinations. With regards to education, the government could, uh, could and try uh, and make it very easy and cheap for students to stay on and continue higher education rather than leave at the age of uh, 16. So if you think about it now, you are, you're all engaged in post-16 study, but there is a degree of choice as to what you have around um, what type of post-16 study you engage in. With regard to the purchase of cars, the governments and insurance companies can, insurance, uh, sorry, can encourage consumers to buy safer, more fuel-efficient cars. If you buy a powerful, high petrol consumption car, you're likely to pay a higher tax and insurance rates. So if we were almost looking at, you know, you can still purchase a petrol car, you can still purchase a very powerful or high petrol consumption car, but as a result, we will tax you more for that. We will tax you less if you buy an electric car or a no tax at all, in some cases, for a, an electric car. So choice still remains, but the government very much so influence our choice by the way in which it's made. Again, some other examples, I've already gone through these, but um, we look at um, getting people to use the salad bar at lunch, encouraging people to use the stairs, um, where best to locate uh, an architect, um, we'll think about where location, where best to locate a hand sanitizers. We also think about traffic flow and speed. Now, one of the crucial points of your essays is that point on evaluation. So evaluation of choice architecture. Consumers may react differently to the presentation of choices and options. So what works well for one may not work well for another. You can be successful in scaring one individual, but you may not be successful in scaring another. Some will follow and some will not. Some will choose the desired outcome, some will not. Ideally, realistically, you need to think about how effective is choice architecture and getting the majority to achieve the desired outcome. If you engage in choice architecture and it doesn't work, your choice of choice architecture wasn't very effective. So it depends upon the effectiveness of the policy that's been used. How well has it been in encouraging people to select the desired outcome? Some consumers may resent the government influence and stick to the preferred choice. They don't like the idea that the government is interfering with their choice they don't like the idea that the government is interfering with their decision making. Choice architecture may be insufficient and other policies such as sugar tax used to reduce demand. So what we're saying here is that choice architecture is good, but it is not the be all and end all of ways to encourage the desired outcome. If anything, as going back to my previous point, should it be used to complement other traditional policies? So this is an example of how behavioral should be used alongside traditional as a means of complementing traditional policies. By nudging consumers into making certain purchases, it may reduce their ability to make decisions for themselves. Again, is there an issue here of the governments being too paternalistic? Are we at risk of creating the nanny state where the governments are making or interfering in too much of the decisions that we as consumers should be making ourselves? Are they removing too much the freedom to make that decision? So freedom remains, but is it being interfered with too often? By nudging consumers into making certain purchases, 
It may reduce their ability to make decisions for themselves. It depends on the quality of information about goods. For example, in the 1980s, it was fashionable to say that fat in diets was damaging, but now evidence is less conclusive. And, uh, and some say that low fat foods can be unhealthy if they encourage excess sugar consumption. So for example, yes, there are more low fat foods out there, but people are likely to consume them alongside another good, which is a very high sugar consumption. So yes, I'll eat low fat crisps, but I'll drink a sugary drink along with that. So in real terms, they're balanced up with your no further forward. More effective when it encourages simplicity in decision making. So choice architecture is more effective when it encourages simplicity. It depends upon the degree as to how uh, it is presented and how well people move with that. An unintended consequence is that it can manipulate consumer decision making and it reduces the ability to make decisions for themselves. And also consumers become more resentful. Nudges. This is, so this is the next uh, behavior policy. This is where the freedom of choice remains for consumers, but certain options are easier to choose than others. Behavioral nudges are an alternative to using taxes and subsidies to influence choices, and many have been or are being applied in public policy making, both in the UK and in a growing number of countries. So a nudge is a gentle, positive reinforcement to encourage, again, individuals to move in a way that is deemed, de deemed to be the most desirable output or outcome. Nudge theory suggests consumer behavior can be influenced by small suggestions and positive reinforcements. There's your definitions, there's what it is. Supporters of nudge theory suggests what that uh, well-placed nudges can reduce market failure. They can reduce either the over consumption of goods and encourage the uh, production and consumption of goods that are historically underproduced. So reduce market failure, save the government money, um, because we're not spending money, for example, on subsidies. They can encourage desirable actions and help increase the efficiency of resource use. And that's very much so linked with um, over and under consumption. If we're over consuming goods, too much resources are being allocated to something we don't want. If there's under consumption, not enough has been allocated towards that. Critics argue nudges can be misused and become a form of social engineering or a way to encourage cons consumers to buy goods that they don't really need. There's an unintended consequence. It's becoming a, a type of social engineering where the governments are manipulating us to behave in a way that they deem to be rational. And often if we are behaving in a way that's deemed to be rational in the eyes of the, uh, the, the government, are we living an irrational lives ourselves? because we're not able to do the things or we are reluctant to do the things that in real terms we actually want to do. In the UK, the Behavioural Insights Units was set up to use behavioural economics in order to improve choices. So this is again what it is, how it works, why we would use it, what's the impact of it. The remit includes making public services more cost effective and easier for citizens to use, improving outcomes by introducing a more realistic model of human behavior to policy and wherever possible, enabling people to make better choices for themselves. And that's a key bit, better choices for themselves as an individual. Some examples we see of organ donation and the importance of form design. So nudging people towards its right to uh, donate your organs. It's deemed to be the socially acceptable thing to do to help other people in their hour of need. Uh, we see cash incentives in the NHS to stop smoking. Uh, we see lotteries to encourage weight loss. Um, so again, we're nudging people to lose weight by almost creating the impression that there's something to win if you do lose weight. Um, the checklist, so whenever you go into a &E, you have to go through a whole process telling them what's wrong with you so that they can judge and justify who is in most urgent need of uh, care and again choice architecture to encourage healthy eating that we've just looked at. Critical evaluation, are behavioral nudges really and truly effective? Behavioral e uh, economics may encourage governments to become too paternalistic 
in their policies attempting to nudge behavior. So nudges are great, but yes, they, the governments are taking on too much the role of the parent. The government is creating too much the nanny state where they are the parent and we are the naughty children. Behavioral economics focuses too heavily on people's vulnerability to fall um, for policies and their psychological biases. It can give the impression that consumers are dumb. So it creates the idea that consumers do not have the mental capacity to make decisions. Now, some consumers lack more mental capacity than others, but it focuses too much on their vulnerability. Um, and it almost plays in the fact that cognitive biases and psychological biases do exist. In fact, consumers using well-practiced rules of thumb might be operating in a rational way. So if you go in and you buy that food and that food increases your utility, then yes, traditional theory would say that's the right decision to make. However, governments make a value judgment that you're not making a decision that is in your best long-term uh, effectiveness. There are clear limits to the application of nudge theory. It may be useful in changing minor behaviors in a modest way, but not in changing deep-rooted psychological problems such as alcoholism, drug dependency, and street finance. So behavior economics are really, really good, but if the issue is too deep-rooted, then it may not be effective solely on its own. You may need the certainly a greater focus on traditional policies and backing that up or complementing that with an integrated approach to behavioral policies. Um, but if it's very deep rooted, then it's not gonna be useful in changing minor behaviors. Conventional policy interventions such as taxes, subsidies, and regulations are often just as effective as nudges because price remains an important determinant of choices in uh, markets. So price remains the most important factor for most consumers when making decisions. I'll stop buying it because it's too expensive. It's not a case of I'll stop buying it because I know it's wrong for me. So we hit them where it hurts with traditional policies of increasing the price. There is a difference between nudging a certain behavior and compelling a certain choice. A good nudge may be considered to be one which encourages a certain choice, but is still transparent and that choice is retained. So the issue we have here is that with nudge policies, are you pushing them too much? Are you influencing too heavy their ability to make that decision? Or are you creating an impression in which freedom of choice is being too heavily removed? If we look at framing as our next and third policy for this uh, part of the video, this is the idea that consumers are influenced by how the idea is presented to them. For example, the way food packaging presents key information like low fat. So for example, if I said, this food contains only, uh, it's 60% fat free. That's framed in a way to say that it's 60% it's fat free, but on the flip side of that, you could argue that it still contains 40% fat. However, 60% fat free sounds more uh, positive than 40% fat. We know that consumers are conscious about fat intake and sugar content uh, intent um, or intake. Therefore, we think carefully about the way in which information is presented. Do we manipulate that information out to influence how consumers make those choices? Framing a question or offering it a different way often generates a new response by changing the comparison set uh, it is viewed in. Small details matter because when making important decisions, people may give greater weight than they should to information that is fairly limited, if any, relevance. In other words, they have adopted a narrow frame of reference. So if we think about even going back to cognitive biases, availability biases, we often think that individuals make decisions based upon the first piece of information given to them. We can use framing to think about what that first piece of information is given to them. So here's a food that contains fat, but if I tell you it's 60% fat free, 
That's more positive than telling you it contains 40% fat. The facts remain that it's 60% fat free and 40% uh, fat, but you have selected information and presented that in a way that is framed to be positive. Altering what information is provided and its design can help people make better decisions. So think about the information that is available and think about how it is altered and how it is designed and how it's presented. People who use narrow framing often draw heavily on automatic defaulted uh, assumptions. One important method of framing is to focus on the gain loss option for consumers from a uh, decision. So pick up on what did they gain and what did they lose? Focus on what they gain and present that and manipulate it in a way that makes it sound in effect better than what it actually is. Consider this example. If you get the flu vaccine, you will be less likely to get the flu. If you do not get the flu vaccine, you are more likely to get the flu. So the first one indicates that there's more gain there by getting the flu vaccine. The second one indicates that there's more losses, loss to your health if you don't get it. So the government will want to encourage individuals to get the flu vaccine. How can they frame that information in a way that will make them sit up, listen, and make the desired outcome? Both statements contain the same information, but they have been framed differently. Studies suggest that framing a choice in a positive way is more likely to increase immunization take-up rates. So again, think about what is the desired outcome? What do we want people to do? And how can we frame information that will get them to make the decision in the way that we want them to do so? Examples of framing, just a few of them here. Um, your privacy settings on social networks, such as Facebook, um, they will be framed in a way that helps you make sure that you're selecting the best privacy setting for you. Um, consent for human organ donation to increase the supply of organs. Framing referendum questions, um, a bit of a sneaky one. Do we frame it in a way that gets consumers to make the outcome? So even though we live in a democracy, people have a degree of choice. Are we influencing that degree of choice to get them to make the most desired outcome? Framing of interest paid on loans, for uh, uh, i.e. presenting as total interest to pay rather than annual percentage rate of interest. So often, if you think about even, I think... Um, Companies that offer higher purchase are very good at doing this. So, for example, if you went to purchase a car right now, for example, um, if you were to look up the website, it rarely would give you, it would give you more information on how much you would pay monthly for this car. So, for example, the car could be £20,000, but it may say to you, you can get this car for £300 a month. They don't actually tell you how much it is over the, the payback period. They just focus on how much you get per month. Asymmetric framing, this involves including an obvious inferior choice or third uh, choice or a hyper expensive third option rather than a simple expensive cheap option, which can be then uh, a guide for consumers towards choosing more expensively priced items. Consider the example of framing of wine prices on a menu or the framing of different options of a firm, uh, oh, sorry, of a film or music streaming service on the uh, internet. If you think about, it, if you're asked to choose um, in a raffle, for example, choose a number between 100 and 1. The most unlikely choices people will make are 1 and 100. They think, you know, 1, there's just a chance of you getting 1 out of 100 than there would be of you getting 32 out of 100 tickets. Um, but people are less likely to choose 1. They're less likely to choose 100 because they just think that's the two extremes. So therefore, I'm likely to go for somewhere in the middle. That is the end of uh, this uh, presentation. Um, I hope that you find that useful. There will be another one now, a follow-up, which is part two, looking at three other types of behavioral economic policies and the overall um, evaluation of all behavioral methods. So like I said, I hope that you find that useful.